Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this one we're going to take a look at an IBM Aptiva mini tower from the year 2000. We'll go over some background and specs and check out how it performs under MS-DOS and Windows Gaming. IBM started the Aptiva family of products after discontinuing the PS1 and PC Junior families in the early 90s. Unlike IBM personal systems like the PS2, the PS1 was more like a regular PC, albeit with typical OEM components that you'd find in a Dell, Compaq or similar. IBM released many lines and models for the Aptiva in an attempt to cast the net wide and attract many different groups of buyers. There was a desktop, mini tower, and even a tower with a media console setup. My model is the E series family, and while I'm not sure what the E actually stood for, I can tell you in many ways it was the economy option. It was so cheap in fact IBM didn't even build it themselves. They contracted Acer to make them instead. This model and type is listed on the case as a 2199-200, and the build is from February 2000. Around mid-1999 to early 2000, it was common to see choices for SuperSocket 7 builds with Cyrix and AMD-based CPUs. The Pentium 2-based Celerons were also common in the lower end, with the Pentium 3 and the faster Celerons being the higher end offerings. AMD had also just released their new Athlon. IBM positioned the Aptiva against the mid-range PC market and had some interesting marketing angles over here in Australia. You could get one bundled with your dial-up internet service provider contract. You could get one for the price of a tiny block of land. And if you wanted to get that block of land anyway, you could still get an Aptiva thrown in with your home loan. Around the year 2000, the Aptiva range started to drop in price, a sign of things to come. IBM had moved a majority of its Aptiva sales to online only in the US presumably to follow the success of Dell, who was leading the way at the time. Here in Australia, IBM did continue to sell them in retail stores for a bit longer. Eventually, IBM, though, they decided the Aptiva days were numbered, and were ushering in the era of the Net Vista. This came as a shock to Acer, as it meant their contract was coming to an end as well. It's okay, though. Give it a few years. They were friends again. So here's the Aptiva I recently got off a nice fella on Facebook Marketplace. While the seller did pack the desktop very well, it appears the clipped-in drive enclosure came loose during transport, and unfortunately the modem card took one for the team. The front of my Aptiva is missing the door unfortunately. I am planning on mocking up a 3D model of the door, but without the measurements it's a bit of trial and error, it might take me some time. Anyway, if I do manage to make it work, I'll upload it to Thingiverse. On the inside, well, we've got one cheap looking motherboard here, with a big SIS 530 chipset. Released under the codename Sidbad, it was released in 1998 on the SuperSocket 7 platform and quickly occupied the bargain and OEM market like this one. It used 168-pin SD RAM and could support up to 256 megabytes of RAM with the cache enabled. You'll notice there was no AGP slot on this motherboard. That's because this board comes with an integrated graphics processor, the 6306. Never heard of this before? Maybe you know it's discrete card, the 6326. This was SIS's first 2D 3D solution, which was marketed as a multimedia solution rather than a 3D gaming solution. But it does support DirectX 6 and OpenGL and maybe it can run something. The CPU in this Aptiva is the AMD K62500, codenamed Chomper Extended, or CXT. It was one of the later K62s announced in August 1999. AMD was spruiking its introduction and the inclusion of it in the Aptiva range. As a standalone part, the 500MHz model was sold here in Australia around the middle of 2000 for around 130 Australian dollars. It was a budget CPU because by then SuperSocket 7 was being quickly phased out for AMD's new Athlon platform. Around this time, I remember I had a K62450 on a Viabay Super 7 board, and I was hanging out for a Socket A Spitfire Duron to hit the store shelf later in the year. For sound, we've got the ESS Solo 1 PCI. It seems to default to a rather useful IRQ5 and should have a good sound blaster and FM support. Checking out the rest of the insides, we have three PCI expansion slots, a floppy disk and a hard disk, one stick of PC100 RAM and a CD-ROM. Turning around to the back, we've got a standard ATX fare including VGA and two USB 1.1 ports. And one of those expansion slots is taken up with a speaker output. I'm assuming this is the amplified one, given we've already got a line out over here. Powering on the machine, we see it post and splash up the big blue logo and the Aptiva branding. K62 at 500 MHz, 8 GB of hard disk and CD-ROM detected. There's the ESS sound, positioning itself at IRQ5, which suits me fine. And I've enabled right combining using a tool called MXK6 Opt. I'll run through the DOS bench pack now. Starting with 3D Bench 1.0C for faster PCs, we get a score of 237.7 frames per second. Chris's 3D Benchmark at 640x480, 94.5 frames per second. PC Player Benchmark at 640x480, 46.2 frames per second. Doom on max detail, 102.2 frames per second. 
Quake at 320 by 200 at 56.3 frames per second. Quake at 640 by 480 27.8 frames per second. Some reasonable scores there thanks to our speedy K62 500. Now let's check out that ESS sound chip with its ESFM and see how it holds up under DOS gaming. Time to take a look at how the Aptiva performs under Windows 98. Starting with Everest, we've got the K62500 running on a 100MHz front side bus. The SIS530 chipset, 119MB of RAM, thanks to that IGP stealing 8MB of it. The DirectX video detail shows what the SIS can support. Running the CPU benchmark in CPU-Z shows we're a little bit slower than the reference K62500 system. Loading up 3D Mark 99 and it doesn't take long for us to see how terrible the 3D performance is. 602 3D Marks is a really poor score. Let's see how real world gaming goes.
The 6306 can play some very early and primitive Direct 3D games at 640x480. I found most of the early Sega Saturn conversions seemed to work alright. Software rendered games like Daytona, Superbike and Quake 2 were playable. The SIS 530, 6302, 6326, no matter which way you call it, it's not really useful for Windows 3D games and should be avoided unless you've got a specific nostalgic niche that makes you want to relive your tortured youth playing games at 240p. It is however a very competent MS-DOS gaming rig and will handle Windows games with software rendering. Well that wraps it up for this one. Thanks for hanging around to the end of the video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.